right. I'm excited about this. I'm really, uh, I'm excited because for the last number of months, God has just been kind of bringing one thing after another to me that once he kind of brings it to me, it just explodes inside of me, you know. So we spent uh, about four weeks a while back on communion, right? God just began to show me things about communion that I'd just really honestly never seen before. It just blew up inside of me, exploded inside of me, right? Spent four weeks sharing that with you. Uh, still very, very excited about that. Uh, and so uh, then, then the next thing that uh, God did was he really began to speak to me about the blessing of Abraham found in Genesis 12. And, and you know, I'd, I'd known about it. I'd even preached about it. I understood it theologically. But somehow God just exploded it inside of me, you know, just like, ah, this is for you. Get it, get it, get it. Tell everybody, you know, share. And so I spent about four weeks on that one, too. And we've done a couple of other things, uh, smaller things since. But uh, there's, there's another message, really, that uh, here it is. God wants to make you great. And it is from the blessing of Abraham. It's from Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. And God's just exploding this inside of me in a huge way, that he wants to speak this into our hearts, that he, his, his goal and, and, uh, and purpose always is to make you great. Right? From the moment he begins to call you, the moment he begins to draw you to himself and work in your life, he wants to make you great. He said so in Abraham. And, and it's just exploding inside of me. It's who he is. It's what he does. And so... Uh, let's, uh, let's get into it, and I want it to really become part of you. Genesis 12, 1 and 2 again, because this is so foundational. When God begins uh, a relationship with Abraham, it's a model. It's a prototype, sort of. It's, it's a model and an example for all of us. So the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And one of the things I noticed even yesterday, too, is, is that, he, that uh, God uses the word great two times here, which, you know, it's there, but I never even really thought about it. He says, I'll make you a great nation, and I'm going to make your name great. And that's pretty interesting that, that God's making these very big promises, isn't he? Uh, apparently, greatness is a good thing. Because it's the, it's the thing that God promises right off the bat, right? I'm a great nation. I'm going to make you a great man, a great name. And so greatness is good. You know, and there's something in us sometimes that shies away from the very idea of it, you know. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes, too, uh, why sometimes that happens. But, but right off the bat, we want to see that God is making these promises, and he wants us to embrace them. He wants us to know he's going he's gonna to greatly multiply us. He's going to make our name great. And when he, you know, from last week, I think we mentioned when God says, I'm going to make your name great, what he really means is, I'm going to make you great, right? It's like, yeah, it's not just your name great, but, but you know, you're not. It's, he's going to make you great, and your name will be honored and respected, and there will be a reputation. I believe that God is appealing here to something that he put inside of us. Because when he created us, he created us with a desire for greatness in some way. And I mean your personal greatness, whatever that looks like for you, right? It doesn't mean everybody's famous. It doesn't mean everybody's, you know... Uh, whatever, you know, great preachers or CEOs or whatever, whatever your personal greatness is, right? That's what God wants for you. Whatever it, whatever it looks like for you to really shine in your life, to really achieve, you know, what, what God has put in your heart, right? The dream, the vision, the desires, right? To become the person that God wants you to be, and you know that, right? That's what greatness really means. And he put that desire in us, and I believe that he's appealing to that right away. I will make your name great. There's something inside of you that should rise up and respond to that and say, I'm in, God, right? I'm in, whatever that looks like for me. And he put that there so it would motivate us. I really believe that. Uh, and it's okay to be motivated by that. It's okay to be motivated by the call to greatness. Because even in, even in Hebrews 11, God says that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, right? Which means he's a rewarder. Is it okay to be motivated also by rewards in walking with God? He says, hey, yeah, I've got great rewards for you. I'm a rewarder of those who diligently right, walk with me and seek me. So, yeah, he wants us to be motivated by that, something in you that hungers for that, desires that. And God says, I, I have it for you. So here's the deal. If God created us, and he did... Right? That means that only God gave you a purpose, right? Your purpose can't be found anywhere else. You don't have to search for it. You don't have to look in a closet. You don't ask, have to ask the world. You don't have to read self-help books. You don't have to make it up yourself. Your purpose for existing and breathing came from God. Amen? <laughs> right? Because he made you, and that's it. So if that's true, and it is, then your personal greatness can only be found in God. 
Your purpose and your personal greatness can only be found in God. It can't be found anywhere else. And there's, the world has its version of greatness and fame and, you know, renown and whatever else, or power or money, whatever else they may think it is. But those things are very artificial. They're very temporary. They don't last. But your personal greatness, whatever that is for you, is found in God. Right? And God wants that to motivate you. He put it in you. He's appealing to that right here. And he wants you to be able to embrace that and run with it. Uh, in Galatians 3, 13 and 14... Uh, we read this uh, quite a while back, and we were talking about the blessing of Abraham. But you gotta, you got to see this again. Have it really, really firm in your heart. It said that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And he did that. He took the curse on the cross. Verse 14 says, So that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus and that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So he specifically says that, that he redeemed us on the cross so that we would receive the blessing of Abraham. Right? And what is the blessing of it? We just read it. Right? God, he said, I will make you a great nation, which means just increase you right? in whatever the way is meaningful to you. I'll increase you. Uh, I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing to many. Right? And so that promise is absolutely given to you, delivered to you in Christ Jesus, and God wants you to know that. Right? So the promise, uh, we, you know, when you, when you read the promise, I will make your name great, I know that you know, many of us otherwise would go, well, that's something for Abraham. It's for somebody else. It's something historical. No, it's for you today. God absolutely wants you to know, right? Lock on to that, right? Lock your, lock your radar, lock your laser onto that because that's absolutely for you. Um, how about Genesis 126? <laughs> I didn't start with it, so I could have. You know, I, I love Genesis 126. I could start any message with Genesis 126. So right, right in the very, very beginning, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion, uh, et cetera, et cetera, over all the earth. All right, so if God says, let us make man in our image, uh, yeah, how many know God is great? Amen? We just sang the song, great are you, Lord, great are you, Lord, and that, was, that wasn't planned at all. It just, all the Bible declares throughout the, the greatness of God, and God says, you know what, I'm gonna, we're going to make man in our image right? And so part of that plan is to make you great, right? If you walk with God. Uh, the word let us make, uh, make actually here is a word, I looked it up many years ago, and it's a, it's a word that does imply kind of a process, right? It's not an instantaneous thing. Now the next, the next verse, 27, not on the screen, but it says, so God created man in his own image. And the word created then is an instant word, right? We know that. He spoke him, he formed him from the dust, he breathed into him, done, boom, right? Created is instant. But when he says, let us make man in our image, he's implying a process, right? Nobody really doesn't, nobody starts out great. Because if you just start off great, God just waves his hand and you're great, that's kind of artificial really, isn't it? You know, right? There's, there's no real meaning in that, you know, but, but God says, no, I'm going to make you in my image, and you walk with me, and because God is great, it's in his very nature, it's who he is, and it's what he does, it's in his nature to continue to work in you and shape you into greatness, amen, because that's what he does. Uh, if you think about it, even in the world, let's put it this way, if you think about it in the world, uh, in our culture here, there are great leaders, they may not even be Christians at all, right, but they're still there's still men or women who have great leadership, right? They've learned that, they, they, they show that. And what great leadership in the world does is that they make everybody around them better, right? They lift people around them, they equip you, they want you to shine, they want you to succeed. They want, you know, if you're in a great company that has a great CEO or a great owner or whatever, right? What they want, they don't just, you know, boss you around and say, do what I say, don't ask questions, right? A great CEO or a great leader will always, right, equip you for more. They want you to shine. They want you to become the greatest you can be. They reproduce greatness around them. Isn't that true? Absolutely. And great coaches, if you're in sports, great coaches will reproduce the greatest athletes, right? They do. Bad coaches, not so much, right? So if you're, you know, just in the natural, if you're an athlete, do you want to, do you want to serve under a great coach or a not so good coach? The great coach because they're going to bring out the absolute best in you they're going to make you the best you can be if you're in business do you want to work for the greatest ceo who reproduces greatness or you want to work for some selfish stingy bossy mean guy right okay you get the idea right okay so we, we understand that just 
where did all that, where did those principles come from? God himself. It's in God's nature to make you great. It's who he is. It's what he does, right? Again, it doesn't mean you become a famous preacher, you know, uh, or, you know, everybody's a CEO or anything like that. But what, what is personal greatness for you? What does God put in your heart that as your life moves forward, and, and again, I don't care what age you are, I don't care if you're 90, I don't care if you're 20, I don't care if you're 50, right? There's always more, amen? There's always more. And so whatever God has in your heart, right, that would be greatness to you, right? He's, he put that there, right? And so he's, he's committed to bringing that out in you if you want him to, if you walk with him and, and you embrace that. God has a specific goal in any relationship he has to make you as great as you can be. And, uh, and I've, I, I really embrace the fact that my job as, as pastor is to help you become great. Amen? <laughs> to equip you and to, to pour into you, right, that, that equipping and that the motivation and that understanding uh, for your personal greatness. That's my job. My job not, is not to uh, just make sure that you, uh, you know, stay out of trouble and make it to heaven, right? <laughs> you know, you don't sin, just hold on and make it to heaven. That's not my job, right? My job is to equip you for your greatness, Amen? God put it there right? so you can become the greatest you can possibly be in your life and in your influence to others. Amen? That's what, that's what God does. Uh, we do know, however, that our road to uh, greatness does involve some struggle, doesn't it? Right? Again, it's artificial if God just waves his hand and boom, you're great. Everything's, you know. Our, our, our road to greatness, walking with God, we absolutely know from experience it involves struggle there's times when, you know, I mean, how many know Jesus' disciples too? They, they had their struggles, didn't they? They had their battles, and he's, and he's trying to work them into their greatness, right? But there was things he had to get out of them, and there's things. He, there's also perseverance on the path to greatness, isn't there? There's times when all you have, it feels like at least, all you have is perseverance. Like just put one foot in front of another and keep going, right? And that's part of God's process, right? Because greatness doesn't come. Uh, you know, for, uh, for wimpiness, spiritual wimpiness. I can't think of a better word right now, but you get the idea, right? Greatness, part of the process is perseverance, right? I put one foot in front of another. I keep learning. I keep trusting God. I keep, lear- you know, going forward. And that's, that's part of the training. Uh, there's times when, you know, God's pruning us and, he's, you know, he's bringing some, something out of us that's hidden inside, some character defect, something that sabotages us, some belief, right, that limits us or, you know, he sabotages us, and he brings it out, and he wants to prune it off, and he wants us to cooperate, and it doesn't feel good, does it? It hurts. It's scary, right? And so our, our, our path to greatness does involve struggle. It's part of the deal, but you have to know in, the, in, in any of those struggles that what God's doing is bringing you to greatness. He said so in Genesis 12 too, right? I will make you great. I will make your name great. Uh, let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18. So, this also, Paul wrote after the, after the cross and resurrection. Uh, he said, but we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So he's uh, initially here talking about, in the context the, the, uh, of the chapter, it says that there's kind of a veil that's over the, over the faces, over the eyes of people, right, when they don't know Christ. And in the context, he's talking about the Jewish people who are kind of still, just all they're seeing is the law, the commandments and the law of the old covenant. And Gentiles also just don't see Jesus, right? There's a veil and there's a blindness. But it says in here that when we begin to turn to the Lord, when our hearts begin to turn toward Jesus Huh, right? The veil is lifted, right? The veil is, is taken away. Sometimes it's a, a progressively a process. Sometimes it's all at once. But this veil is taken away. We see Jesus. We believe in Jesus, right? We have the revelation of Jesus. Nobody can take that away from us ever again, right? And then it says as we're, be, as, we're, as we're worshiping Jesus, we're reading his word, we're seeing him revealed to us, we're seeing him with spiritual eyes, it, says, it describes it here as beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, and that, that as we look at Jesus, we're being transformed into the same image, his image, from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. So 
hear it, you know, this isn't a self-help program, right, where we just pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and we share good principles for, you know, a better life. This is transformation by looking at Jesus. As you see Jesus revealed, you're transformed. Amen? And the Holy Spirit does it, and it's entirely divine, a divine operation of God. It's His grace. It's His working. Right? And, and so looking at Jesus is like one of the greatest things we can do. And me revealing Jesus to you more and more is one of the greatest things I can do. And so it says that in that process, we're being changed into His image from glory to glory. And for a long time, I didn't really, you know, I didn't process too much of the glory to glory part, you know, because... What does that mean? Well, I know that, you know, on on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus went up with his disciples and, you know, Moses and Elijah showed up and, you know, Jesus is shining, right? The... His, he just starts shining with white light and, you know, this glory and radiance. And I'm thinking, okay, that's it. And, and that is part of it. It absolutely is, right? Just this, this radiance of God's presence in us, increasing, increasing. True. But it's a lot more than that. Because the word glory, right, in the Bible, both New Testament and Old Testament, it just also speaks of just excellence in every way. It speaks of transformation and excellence, right? And so glory to glory means that your dreams are getting bigger and your vision is getting bigger. Glory to glory means that your faith is growing. Glory to glory means that your love is growing. Glory to glory means that your creativity is growing. It means that your wisdom is growing. It means that your effectiveness in life is growing. It means that your relationships are healthier and better. Amen. This is all, it's all very practical stuff, right? It, it, tra- it changes into a person. It's actually greatness. It's you becoming the greatest person you can possibly be in your relationships, in your ministry, in your, your job or career or your life, in every way, your character, your heart, who you are transformation that's happening, right? So that's the idea. God has greatness in mind for you. And he never says glory to halfway there and then I quit. He says glory to glory, right? He's just taking you all the way. He's absolutely committed to this. Uh, Let's see. All right. Uh, I, I feel like God's people have... Traditionally, God's people struggle to embrace the call to greatness uh, because we've learned a lot more about false humility than we have about greatness. Amen? <laughs> yeah, and that's a, that's a religious spirit behind that. And it, in it, in it, every, every, I believe that every church, every branch of Christianity battles to some degree with that religious spirit because it really wants to turn the, the greatness of God and the, the amazing work that Jesus will do in our lives wants to, you know, wants to really take the power out of it, take the glory out of it, take the greatness out of it, and boil it down to just religion, right? Where it doesn't have life, it doesn't have power, it doesn't have transformation, right? It's just religion. And so the false humility is really one of the devil's tools, if I can be that blunt. It really is. You know, and false humility is, oh, you're not worthy of anything. Who are you to think, you know, that you could ever become anything better? Who are you to think God would ever use you? Who are you to think that God could ever really bless you? Who are you to think, you know, and maybe that's for somebody else. Maybe it's for Moses. Maybe it's for, you know, Elijah's job. But who are you? And that, that false humility is actually uh, a, a devil's tool. It just truly is. It's uh, the religious spirit trying to steal, kill, and destroy your potential and your calling in God. Amen? To sabotage that before you really ever get started with it. So I want, I want to show you something, actually, two verses that I think just kill that thing. <laughs> uh, one is Exodus 11, verse 1 to 3. 1 through 3. So, you know, somehow in our mind, the call to greatness conflicts with our sense of false humility, right? And we wouldn't call it false humility, but it is. Uh, And so uh, I want to show you what it says about Moses, something about Moses. Uh, So Moses was uh, raised in Egypt. He's Jewish, right? But he's a Hebrew, but he's raised in Egypt for 40 years. And then he's out in the desert 40 years as a shepherd. I'm making a very long story very short. And then God appears to him and calls him and says, I'm going to send you to my people who are 
in slavery in Egypt, right? And you're going to lead them out. You're going to confront Pharaoh, and you're going to, you know, lead my people to freedom and lead them into the promised land. And I can still just imagine Moses going, I'm going to do what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Confront Pharaoh? <laughs> Set all of your people free? <laughs> oh, sure. Okay, no problem, right? Imagine his head just exploding at that one, right? But uh, he, he obeys God, right? And God sends him into Egypt, and, you know, he's confronting Pharaoh, and, and he's talking to the Hebrews, right, his people, and telling them God's going to take him to the promised land. And, and pretty soon, you know, Pharaoh says no, and God starts sending plagues on Egypt. Okay, that's the story. That's the context. And then here, uh, Exodus 11, 1, the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterwards, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out of here altogether. Keep going. And speak now in the hearing of this people, and let every man ask from his neighbor and every woman from her neighbor articles of silver and articles of gold, <laughs> literally asking their Egyptian neighbors for their precious stuff. And here we go. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And I read all this to get here. Moreover, the man Moses was what? Very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. Wow. There we go. Okay, that's our confirmation again that God wants to make you great. Well, that's just Moses. No, it's, it's the blessing of Abraham and it's for you in Christ Jesus, right? God promises to make you great. Whatever personal greatness is to you, right? You don't have to go and confront a Pharaoh, but whatever it is to you, it's part of the promise. But here's the deal. Moses obeyed, right? He, he believed God. He was probably terrified, you know. It was probably, you know, um, he, but he, he obeyed. He goes and he starts doing this, right? And there's the struggle. There's the process. God didn't just wave his hand and suddenly Moses is all that, you know. He had to face his fears. He had to risk. He had to, you know, obey God, you know. And and it says that the result is he becomes great. He's great in the sight of the people. He's great in the sight of the Hebrews. He's great in Egypt, even, even Pharaoh's servants. Everybody says, what's Moses going to say? What does Moses have to say about this? What's Moses going to do? Right? Everybody's eyes are on Moses, right? And that's the deal. When God makes you great, people look to you for what you're going to say. Right? They're not looking for somebody else who will just blah, 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 you know, just garbage comes out of their mouth. They're, lo they're looking to you because you, right? You have something to say to them that's going to lift them, that's going to encourage them, that's going to empower them, that's going to clarify them. You have that, right? And that's part of the greatness. There's a whole lot more to it, but it's part of it. You're the one, right? So if Moses becomes very great, not just great, but very great, uh, I also want you to, to read Numbers 12.3, where some years later here, uh, after they're out of Egypt, uh, there's a whole story here, and I'm not even going to read the story. I just want to pull, pull out this one verse. Uh, because Moses responded to a situation with, uh, in a very uh, humble way, uh, and, and the, uh, the, the, parenth the in parentheses comment here says, now the man Moses was, well, also what? Very humble, more than all the men who are on the face of the earth. And I think this is really amazing if you combine those thoughts together. That Moses was very great, and he was very humble. Okay? So this isn't false humility. This is true humility. And greatness is always based out of true humility, right? But false humility always produces the belief that you can never be anything, never accomplish anything, never, never have more or do more than you are now, right? That you'll never matter, right? That's false humility. It's a religious spirit. It's a devil. And it's designed to sabotage God's people, right? But true humility is a basis for greatness because God told Moses, I'm going to make, yeah, I'm going to make you a leader. And God Basically, Moses did give him a little bit of an argument, you know, but, but essentially he said, all right, all right, I'm in, I'll do it, right? And he went with it, and he faced his fears, and he obeyed God, and he took risks, and he did everything that was in front of him to do, and he becomes very, very great. And I believe, personally, that Moses would be, was becoming great and humble at the same time. God was working both of those things in him simultaneously, amen? Right? And so humility isn't, I'm a nobody. Humility isn't, I can never do anything great or, you know, I'm nobody. Who am I? Humility is, God, if you call me to greatness, I'm not arguing. You're God. If you call me to be influential, my answer is yes. I'm not going to argue with you, right? I'm just going to cooperate, right? I'm yours. My, yeah, that's, that's humility. God, you tell me to do something, I'll do it, right? God, you, you speak truth to me, I'll believe it. God, you correct me, I'll take it. 
right? You teach me, I'll take it, right? Humility is that, and that's the basis for true greatness. So never let false, humi- false humility rob you of your call to personal greatness. Uh, Moses put an end to that one for us, I believe. You know what's really interesting, too? What's fun? Uh, who wrote this verse? Moses, <laughs> right? Moses writes the, he writes the first five books of the Bible, so in parentheses, he's like, yeah, I am the most humble guy on all the earth. <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't even kidding, right? <laughs> he was, <laughs> I think that's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, that's why I believe God's people have struggled to embrace our call to greatness. We've learned a lot more about false humility than we have about greatness, right? And we need to talk about greatness because God has a call for you to greatness, personal greatness, whatever that looks like for you. Uh, how about Genesis 24? Verse 35. And so... I'm jumping around a little bit here, but here's another point I want to make. Uh, God promised Abraham that he was going to make him great, great name, great nation. And uh, so some years later, we see the result of this. God did make Abraham great. And uh, some years later, Abraham has his son with his wife, Sarah. The son's name is Isaac. Isaac grows up and becomes a man, and he's ready to have a wife. And Abraham sends a trusted servant back to kind of his homeland, right, where he came from, to look for a wife for my son Isaac, right? Go and find her and bring her back. So the, the servant goes forth, and he finds uh, this woman, Rebecca, and uh, her, her family, and he believes that she's the one. And so the servant is talking to Rebecca and her family, and he says here in Genesis 24, 35, the Lord has blessed my master greatly, and he has become great. Isn't this awesome? Are you getting the idea that God doesn't call you, if, if God calls you, you know, to follow him, he, his calling is not for you to be mediocre? Follow me and I will make you mediocre. Follow me and I will make you a little less than average. Yay, follow me and nobody will ever know who you are and you won't make any difference at all. Follow me, just hide in church until the rapture and Jesus gets you out of, out of this horrible place. Is that what his calling is? Absolutely not. And I, I think that that's also been... A rabbit trail, but I think that's also been, you know, part of the mentality in the body of Christ, you know, and, and we, had, we had a couple of decades of, of books and teachings and, you know, novel series and everything telling us that the whole plan is Jesus is going to get us out of here. And I believe Jesus is coming, and I believe he is going to take us to heaven, you know, for, a, for something called the wedding supper of the Lamb, and I believe he's going to bring us back to earth, and he's going to set up a kingdom, and we're going to reign with him. I believe Jesus is coming. But the mentality has been, you know, for, for some reason that I can't fathom, the mentality was, let's hide in church and just wait for Jesus to get us out of here. Right? <laughs> and that's a terrible thinking. Is that really, if you just take that out and examine that in light, is that really how Jesus wants us thinking? He trained his disciples, don't be afraid, fear not, have faith, right? And go out and change the world, rock the world, right? Make disciples of nations. And now it's hide in church and wait for the rapture? When, when did that change? When did, you know, when? The, now, Jesus is still producing greatness in people, isn't he? He's still calling us to change the world. I don't care if we knew that we knew for an absolute fact that Jesus is coming next year. What should we do, hide in church and wait, or should we just make this year absolutely count and be the greatest we can be and influence everybody we can? Well, yeah, that's, that's the calling, right? That's the calling. So, you know, God says, or the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the servant says to Rebecca and her family, the Lord has blessed my master and he has become great. It's God's plan, it's who he is, it's what he does. If you walk with God, it's just, if you walk with God closely, it's pretty unavoidable if you let him influence you this way. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female servants, and camels and donkeys. And I thought right off the bat here is on the surface level, this is just talking about wealth, isn't it? God made my master great. He's got herds and flocks. He's got servants. He's got gold. He's got silver. He's, he's, he's rich, right? Uh, is, is wealth and resources part of the blessing of Abraham? Yes, it is. It absolutely is. You know, uh, is that a measure of our spirituality? Not necessarily, not necessarily, but sometimes, sometimes God, God blesses people. He calls you to, you know, to increase. Yeah, sometimes, you know, but if you're, if you're, if you're poor, you know, does that mean you're not close to God? Not at all. It doesn't mean that at all. But does it mean that God still would want to increase you? Let's say yes. Let's say yes. Okay? Yeah. So, you know, would you, this is a, this is a blessing. This is part of God's heart. 
Uh, would you rather be the person that says, oh, praise the Lord, I want to testify to the church pastor because yesterday I needed a nickel and I found a nickel. I was walking down the street and there was the nickel that I needed. No, oh, praise God. Or would you rather be the person when the, you know, we, we're, a missionary comes in, we're going to raise an offering for the missionary, that you pull out your checkbook and say, how many zeros? Which would you rather be, right? I'm not talking about just you have a beautiful car. I'm talking about you're, you're, right? you're a kingdom person and you invest in the kingdom and you help make it happen. Why? Because God has entrusted you with resources, right? right? God, and, God does want to bless us with resources, but he wants to be able to trust us with them, right? And he wants, yeah, to be able to know that we have a kingdom first and he wants us to know, you know, that, that uh, our character is sort of a match for our resources. Amen? <laughs> right? So, yeah. So God, the, the material uh, resources are absolutely part of the blessing of Abraham. They really are. Right? So wherever you are, can you just believe that God wants to increase you? Again, you know, I'm not talking about you. There's, there's not like a bar you have to hit. Wherever you are, can you believe that God wants to increase you? Yes. 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 Let's say yes. But then, then there's a description um, of Solomon. It's in 1 Kings 4, 29. And uh, here we know Solomon, gets King David's son. He's going to be the next king. And uh, Solomon, uh, when, he was, when he was becoming king, he uh, went and worshipped God extravagantly. Right? And uh, that night, Solomon dreams. The Lord appears to him and he says, Solomon, ask me anything. Right? Blank check. Ask me anything. What would you like? You know, and Solomon says, I want you to give me wisdom and understanding to be a good leader for your people. Amen? To be a great leader for your people, God. And God was like, that is such a great request. You didn't ask for riches. You didn't ask for victory or territory or long life or, you know, beautiful women or whatever. You asked for, for the wisdom and heart and understanding to be a good leader for my people. That is awesome. I'm also going to give you riches and long life and power. <laughs> right? I'm going to give you, right? And so God did. It said, but here's a description, uh, part of the description of Solomon. It wasn't just riches, which we know Solomon had. Here it says that God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding. And the next three words just blow me away. Largeness of heart. Oh, largeness of heart, like the sand on the seashore. What is that? Well, I know wisdom and understanding, right? That means you have God's mind on things, right? I mean, yeah, it was... You know how to solve problems. You know how to succeed. You know how to help other people succeed, right? You have heaven's strategies, right, for, for being a blessing. Um, you have great understanding to, to lead God's people and do justice, do righteousness, right, and have systems in place where God's great people, Israel, right, all, of, all systems were working beautifully, right? Everything's functioning and prospering. That was the wisdom that he, from God. That's part of the blessing of Abraham, by the way. And... Then he says he gave him largeness of heart. And that just, oh, that just, ugh, that wrecks me. Largeness of heart suggests to me that, you know, you're, that his heart just became bigger in the sense of the capacity to love, capacity to understand, capacity to have compassion, capacity to right, <clears throat> be a just leader in all kinds of ways. If, I, if, we, if we said, um, well, this person has a real small heart, as opposed to if I said, this person has a really big heart. We all know what that means, right? We're not talking medical, like we're not talking he has a disease, right? We're saying a small heart is a person who's selfish, self-focused, small, stingy, you know, easily offended. You, don't, you know, they're just tough to be around. You know, it's all about me and, you know, they can't think about anybody else. But, uh, but somebody has a big heart, that means they're generous, doesn't it? It means they, they love people. It they, means they, they are able to love people that are difficult to love. Right? And if God is, is giving you largeness of heart, uh, you find that you, that you start loving people who before were just really tough to love. Like, how could I, you know, <laughs> I can't even stretch myself that way, right? And God's like, oh, I'll just stretch your heart. Oh, okay. <laughs> right? I'll give you a larger heart to love, to, to love in a sacrificial way, right? Self-sacrifice is, is really the mark of true love, by the way, right? Jesus loved us and he gave his life for us. So we love sacrificially. We love in larger ways. We love people that are difficult to love. We have more compassion. We have more understanding. We have more patience, right? We have, oh, just largeness of heart. 
Oh, I love that so much. Okay? Understanding and wisdom, largeness of heart like the sand of the seashore. So that's part of the blessing. That's part of uh, the blessing of Abraham. It's part of our greatness, our personal greatness. So, you know, what, what would it have been like? We just compared the two verses of Abraham and Solomon, right? What would it be like if Abraham had gold and silver and flocks and herds and, you know, everything else, but he had a tiny little selfish heart? Tiny, stingy little heart. Would that, be, would that be glorifying God? Would that be a match at all? No, clearly not, right? Clearly not. What's more important is the heart. Can we agree on that one? Absolutely. What's more important is the heart. God wants to transform our hearts. God wants you to become great inside first, and then the greatness starts to show. Right? The greatness is in you and becomes who you are, God's nature growing inside of you. But then it starts to show on the outside in terms of you're blessing people, you're loving people, you're helping, you're lifting people, you're right, reproducing greatness in other people. Part of the definition of greatness is helping other people become great. Amen? And that's exactly what God does, right? He makes his people great, his leaders great, and then uh, God's great people help other people become great. When you're investing in anybody around you to help them become great, you're already becoming great yourself. Amen? <laughs> when you look at anybody around you and you're pulling out the best in them and you're encouraging them, right, and you're speaking to their life, faith and hope and vision and dream and confidence, and, right, you're, you're, that's, it goes back to, to good leadership in this world, right? We know that good CEOs, good coaches, good leaders, right, they reproduce greatness in people around them. They're never small-minded and say, well, you know, I'm just going to climb up on you. I'm going to kick you down and get on top of you, and I'm going to kick you down and get on top of you. Those, that's, that's a terrible leader. That's, a, that's, right? that's an abusive, selfish, insecure person that does that. Right? So people that always lift other people, that's a great leader. That's a great person. That's what God's doing in, in, he's doing in you and me and all of us. Amen? So good. Uh, so one more, one more story I want to share quickly, uh, and then we'll, then we'll pray. It starts in 1 Samuel 22, and I'm just going to read verse 1 and 2. And this is about uh, King David. Uh, but what I'm reading here is that when David, well, I'll back all the way up. When David was a teenager, he's a shepherd boy, right, in Israel and taking care of uh, the, the herds, the flocks. And uh, David had a little sling, and he would kill the bear or the lion if they attacked his herd or his flocks, rather. And uh, then uh, one day, uh, Israel was at war with the Philistines, right? and among the Philistines are some genetic freaks called giants, right? And a guy named Goliath, right? And they were literally genetic freaks. It traces back to, like, Genesis 6. But these guys are still on the earth, some of them. And they, uh, they're just abs they're actually freakishly large. Right. I mean, they're, you know, <laughs> right. And uh, they're genetic freaks of some sort. And, and, and they're among the Philistines. And so the Philistines are uh, want to uh, have war with Israel. Right. And, the, and Goliath, they're saying, you, you know, we'll choose our champion. Goliath, you choose your champion. And whoever wins, the other side is slaves to, you know, to us. Right. And so that's happening on the front line. Goliath is going, send me a man to fight with. Right. And and all the all the soldiers in Israel are going, ah. <laughs> you know, and then teenage David is taking care of his flocks, and, and mom or dad sends him to the front line of battle with lunch for his brothers, who are soldiers. David brings lunch to his brothers, and he says, hey, what's going on here? And they say, well, there's a, a giant named Goliath who's challenging us to a battle, right? And nobody wants to fight him. And David goes, oh, I'll do it. <laughs> he's like 15, or who knows? You know, he's a, he's, he's a teenager or something. And uh, David's like, oh, yeah, I got it. I got it. So he, he goes and he, he says, God's with me. I got this. And he brings his sling, right, like a slingshot or whatever, and he whoosh, takes him down, kills him, sinks a stone in his head, cuts his head off, and he's like, all right, brother, here's, here's your lunch. I'm going back to the, you know. I'm going. <laughs> so David kills this giant. Uh, and some time later, David ends up in the courts of King Saul. King Saul is not a great king. He doesn't really have a heart for God. Right? But David ends up in the courts of King Saul, and he's sort of being trained up in the courts of Saul there somehow. Uh, but David loves God, and he's be starting to become a great leader. He's starting to become a great young man, and people are admiring him and looking to him and respecting him and, you know, following David. And Saul, King Saul becomes jealous. Saul is insecure, and he's got a small heart, and he's jealous of David. And instead of trying to make David great, he's, he wants to compete with him and say, oh, you know, for me to be great, you have to be small. So Saul makes the great decision, you know, he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to kill David. 
I'm going to hunt him down and kill him. And David hears, and he runs away. And David spends probably the next 15 years or 10 years, whatever, in the, in the wilderness uh, hiding from Saul, trying to stay alive, right? So, but David has a prophecy from a prophet named Samuel. David knows that he's called to be the next king of Israel. He knows this, right? And uh, so he's hiding from King Saul. That's the whole setup, and I had to tell you all that just so this makes sense. So David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. So he became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. This is the part I wanted you to see. And when David's out in the wilderness, you know, he's, uh, he's, still, he's got some leadership. He's already prophesied to be king. He's a man of integrity. He loves God, right? He, he believes in his future. He believes in his own call to greatness. Uh, and out in the wilderness, while he's waiting, hiding from Saul, it says about 400 guys gather to him, and most of these guys are, it says they were in distress, in debt, and discontented, which means they were the messed up people from Israel, and they go find David outside, you know, outside of the city and say, can we follow you? Can we hang with you? He's like, okay, I guess I'm your leader, right? And essentially, David, if you just want to be this blunt about it, David is the leader of a whole bunch of pretty much losers, you know, I mean, the most messed up, broken guys, you know, they're just, the, they're kind of the losers, right? And, uh, you know, he's like, yay, in the next game of Israel, here's my, here's my team. But, you know, what David does, because David believes in his personal greatness, and he believes in their call to greatness also, David begins transforming these guys. And they become amazing warriors, right? Mighty men, right? I see you know where I'm going there. Yeah, they become these amazing warriors. They become these amazing military men, amazing leaders, because they're transformed by David's leadership. They're transformed by David's belief and faith in God, right? And how he, and his, his code of honor and his sense of, you know, they just, they get transformed. And, and so uh, what happens then is when David's like 30 years old, he does become king. And now let's read it in First Chronicles 11, uh, 10 to 12. It says, now these were the heads of the mighty men whom David had. What happened to the distressed, the indebted, and the discontented? What happened to the band of losers and broken guys? They are now called mighty men. These are the same guys. These are the same guys right, who are transformed uh, into greatness. And they're called the mighty men whom David had, who strengthened themselves with him in his kingdom, with all Israel, to make him king, according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Uh, 11 and 12. And this is the number of the, there it sees, says it again, mighty men. That's actually what these guys are called, right? It didn't just say the word once. It says it multiple, many times in the scriptures. These were David's mighty men, right? Uh, and I can't pronounce some of the names, but it's all right. Go to, the, go to verse 12. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the ah Ahohite, who was one of the three mighty men. So here's from what I've uh, kind of observed and figured out here. Uh, there appears to, out of that 400, there appears to be 37 guys who are like these crack leaders. They're called the mighty men, right? And out of those 37, there's three that are the top, like his generals, right? Mighty, mighty men, right? And uh, what's, what's the whole point? God wants to make you great. You know, if you identify with the band of the discontented, the indebted, and the broken, and the losers, and, the, you know, the outcasts, and whatever else, right? And you, you, you know, come to David. But guess what? David is a prophetic picture of Jesus here. David is a picture of Jesus. And these broken guys, messed up guys, are a picture of the disciples, First, the, the 12 of Jesus, and now all of us, right? We come to Jesus, who's the greatest leader in the world, the greatest ever, and he transforms them, he transforms you and me into our personal greatness, whatever that looks like for us, right? Yeah, yeah, that's so, so cool. He's, uh, uh, Jesus trains these disciples, and here's, here's kind of the last comment I want to make about this, uh, is... A lot of times in Christian circles, in my experience, when we talk about discipleship, you know, I'm a disciple of the Lord, right? What does that mean? Somebody teaches you about discipleship. A lot of what I heard in the past was, is discipleship is interpreted as this very rigid kind of, you know, set of rules and what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. It's, there's these rigid disciplines. If I'm a disciple, this is what I do. This is what I don't do, right? And uh, I don't know if you, if you heard that, but I was exposed to a lot of that, and I think a lot of people were. 
and uh, began to question that. Is that really, um, if you look at Jesus transforming his disciples, is that really what he did? All right, you guys, you're my disciples. Here's, here's the rules. It's, gonna, it's pretty rigid. It's tight, but it's right. And, uh, you know, here's what you're not allowed to do anymore. Stay saved, wait for the rapture. Is that, is, that what the, is that what the plan was? No, when Jesus made disciples, what he made, he transformed them into guys who believed that with God anything is possible. He transformed them into guys that believed that they could disciple nations, that they could reach nations and touch nations. He transformed them into guys who believed in miracles, right? guys who were great leaders transforming people's lives around them. He transformed them, just like we've been talking about, into people who reproduced greatness in everybody else around them. Amen? It wasn't guys who were just in this tight little regimen of what to do and what not to do, right? It was guys who reproduced greatness all around themselves. Anybody who got in their, you know, circle of influence. That's what a disciple is. is that's what Jesus did, right? He transformed anybody around him, leading them into their personal greatness, and then said, now you do the same, right? With God, all things are possible. Amen? Yeah, yeah. So, disciples are really people who continually expand their territory, continually learning and growing, right, and becoming more influential, growing in their personal greatness, whatever that looks like to you, right? That might, uh, God might use you in, in a job or a career, in your social circle, in your neighborhood, in your family, in your loved ones, you know, in ministry, in whatever it is for you, right? A hobby, I don't know, you know. So uh, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to share with you is embrace your call to greatness. Amen? And, and I believe that first and foremost, what that looks like is a transformed heart. Right? That's where he works first. Amen? But then it does turn into increasing excellence in everything you do, increasing creativity, increasing dream and vision, increasing influence, increasing resources increasing. It does. That's the blessing of Abraham. It's God's divine hand working in your life. Amen? Amen. So, yeah. Let's take territory. We're not waiting for the rapture. Amen? Although it is coming. <laughs> let's pray. Uh, let's, uh, in fact, um, if you have the communion elements too, uh, as we're, as we're going to pray here, just have communion ready. All right, if you didn't get communion elements coming in, you can just raise your hand and... Uh, I know Chris will bring it over to you. Okay, okay. So let's pray and just uh, embrace this calling from God. Thank you, God, as you spoke to Abraham. Follow me into your personal promised land. Follow me into the life that I have for you. And I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. You'll be a blessing to many. Thank you, God, that that promise is for us. Jesus extended that promise to us in the new covenant. And Jesus reproduced greatness in his disciples. He reproduced big dreams, big vision faith, influence, greatness in his disciples. And he's reproducing that in us today. We accept that calling, God. We say yes. Yes to your call to greatness. Yes to your call to largeness of heart. Increased capacity to love. Wisdom and understanding greater influence, greater resources. Hallelujah. Greater wisdom. 
greater impact in our life. Yes, God, to your calling. Thank you, God, that you are transforming us from glory to glory into your image as we see you, Jesus, as we see you revealed to us more and more. You're transforming us from glory to glory. God, we do ask that you also work in our hearts, make our hearts truly humble, which is the really the foundation for the greatness you have planned for us. God, we identify with David's men, many of us who came to Christ very broken in some way, outcast in some way. We identify with that. But like David transformed those men. You know what? Something I didn't mention during that time, and I want to I mention it right now, even in our prayer, is remember David killed that giant Goliath? How many know that Goliath had some brothers? There was some other giants like him among the Philistines. And you know what happened to them? David's men killed them all. <laughs> David's men put an end to them because they followed David the giant killer. And giant killers reproduce giant killers. And Jesus is turning us Symbolically speaking, Jesus is turning us into giant killers also. He's turning us into mighty men. Jesus, as we follow you, you're turning us into your mighty men and mighty women who, who become what we never dreamed we could become. Hallelujah. People with largeness of heart. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You say yes, yes. Just whisper that to him. Yes to the calling. Yes to your call to personal greatness, Jesus. Work it in me. Jesus, if there's, if there's false humility in me, if there's false humility that would say, oh, that's not for me, I can't, I couldn't ever. If, you, if you're aware that that's in you, ask the Lord to just take that out right now. Jesus, take out of me false humility. It's a religious spirit. It's a sabotage from the enemy. Take it out, take it out. It's a lie. It's a trap. But instead, Jesus, grant me true humility and true greatness. Even as I embrace, Lord, that it's a process. There's a process to it. But yes, wherever I am in life, there's more ahead of me. There's growth ahead of me. There's accomplishment. There's influence ahead of me. Hallelujah. There's greatness ahead. Amen. So Jesus, we, we take the bread and the cup. You, you said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. But you also clarified what you're saying is feed on my presence. Jesus, you told us to feed on your presence, on who you are, on your greatness, on your love, on your, your glory presence, pouring into us and transforming us and equipping us and strengthening us and reproducing greatness in us because it's who you are and it's what you do. Thank you, Jesus. We receive that today. Let's eat and drink together. Father, bless everybody here. Bless everybody here. Bless everybody watching. Pour out your spirit upon them more and more, God. Your glory presence, let your hand be with them and upon them, God. Your blessing increase in their lives. Oh, hallelujah, in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody says amen, amen.
God bless you. I love you. Thanks for being here today.